Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody feeling today? Ready to go? Dodging raindrops? I told uh, Brother Shane and Sister Wendy as I walked in today, I said on my way to church, I passed Noah in the ark out on 367, but uh, surely this will come to pass as well. We may get a little more rain. In fact, I I was telling our prayer meeting last night uh, on my phone, as many of you have, the weather channel app or some sort of weather app, and I was just scrolling through to see when this rain is going to let up, and I just kept scrolling and kept scrolling, and there's a, a great chance of rain for the next two weeks here in Cabot. So uh, uh, our, our grass will be about four feet high whenever we can finally get it dried out to where we can cut it, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. I want you to stand with me if you would, and I want us just to take a moment and shake last week out of us right now. Uh, I don't know if you woke up ready to go today. Um, it's always interesting to me to find out who is a morning person and who's not a morning person. If you are a morning person, would you just wave at me? Uh, you know what's interesting about that is whenever I ask that question, the people that are morning people, they're quick to wave at me because they've been up for a long time. How many of you, uh, you're here, and that's about it right now. You're not a morning person. (laughs) You like to get up at the crack of noon. Uh, But we're glad you made it up today, and you look nice for, for not being a morning person. You look nice, so I'm glad that you're here. I want you to turn, uh, and we'll do a little more of this in just a second, but I want you to turn and just shake hands with a couple of people, not not the ones right next to you, but somebody else, a couple of people, and greet them. Tell them they look nice today, and you appreciate them and them being at church today. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Uh, You can be seated. I uh, am happy to tell you that uh, we have a brand new addition to the New Life family. Uh, Emerson Gates was born. uh, Mandy and Dennis Gates' son was born on Friday morning. And we're thankful for his arrival. He's a good-looking boy. And uh, when I saw him Friday night in the hospital, I took note that he has a full head of hair, uh, so much so that he's got a part going already in his hair. And I looked at Brother Dennis, I said, that looks like a preacher part right there. So maybe there's a preacher going to be in that house. But I appreciate the Gates family. They appreciate all of your prayers. And uh, I know in, in, in time they will make uh, bring him here and he'll make his entrance into our family. But we're thankful for the Gates family. Uh, I went to the eye doctor on Friday, and uh, how many of you, this is not meant to embarrass anybody, but how many of you wear some sort of multivision lens in your glasses or your contacts? Would you raise your hand? Uh, I, I just entered into that a, a, a couple of years ago, and uh, I didn't do it with glasses. These are just cheap, you know, Walgreens readers. Uh, I did it with contacts. I, I didn't realize there are progressive lenses as far as contact lenses that you can use kind of as bifocals. And so I've been using those for the last couple of years, and they just haven't quite produced what I wanted as far as being able to see adequately. So I went back to single vision lenses uh, now. So you are looking crystal clear right now. (laughs) Everything on this pulpit I can hardly see right now. Uh, So I'm going to have to use my readers today. And uh, it it made me remember uh, back many, many years ago when I first started preaching, uh, I had glasses that were just a replacement in case my contacts were lost or something like that. And Brother Odell, I wore my glasses. I thought, you know what? It's a preacher thing to do to wear glasses, take them off, point with them. That's just a preacher thing that you should do. So I thought, I'm not going to wear my contacts when I go preach somewhere. I'm going to wear my glasses. And so I did. 
And uh, I, I still remember where I was, Jason. I was preaching in Redfield, just an hour or so from here. And I, I started preaching. I had my glasses on. And I went down on the front row and just preaching away. And I whipped them off because I knew that I watched preachers do that and pointed with them and felt the anointing when I did that. And I just kind of laid them over on the front chair without even thinking and went back up to the pulpit and looked down at my notes only to realize I can't read anything right now. I thought, I'm going to have to go with the anointing right now because I left my glasses down there. So y'all pray for me this morning for my vision. But I, I feel good. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord with you. And thank you, Sister Celinda, for opening up this class. We have been studying through the book of 1 John. And um, I would like you to do this. Before we actually read some scripture and get to our text in this uh, sanctuary class today, I would like you, just with the people that are around you, to discuss this one thing, just for a moment. I want you to think back to your childhood. And for some, that's a few years ago. For others, there's many, many years between childhood and where you're at now. But I want you to think back. And I don't want us to think about necessarily anything negative. We all could probably come up with a, a, a negative memory or something. But I want you to think back on a good memory. Maybe it is a tradition that your family had. It's a trip that you took as a family. It's something along the lines of a good, positive memory. And let me just begin. I'll tell you one, and maybe this will get the conversation going, and then I want you just to take a moment and share something maybe with someone around you, just something good from your childhood. When I was a child, uh, in fact, all during my growing up years, my dad worked for Ford Motor Company, and he would work all sorts of different shifts. And one of the shifts that he would work was swing shift, where he'd go in about 3 or 4 in the afternoon. And he would sometimes work till 1 or 2 in the morning. And there was a donut shop in the town in which my dad worked called Rudy's Donuts. And it is a well-known fact for people that know me that I am a donut fan. Uh, I'm on the, a quest to find the world's perfect donut, and I'm still on a worldwide quest for that. Um, in fact, uh, well, I won't get into that. I, I'm just on a quest for a good donut. Uh, but my father, and let me, I'm going to blame it all on my dad right now, because when I was a child, my dad would get off of work at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, and he would go buy Rudy's Donuts. And at that time, they were just making the donuts for later that morning. And he had this thing going on with Rudy, that when Jim walked through the door, he'd say, Jim, how many do you want? Well, I need a dozen of them. And he'd get them hot. He'd get them fresh, the glaze just dripping off of them. Ooh, I feel the anointing right now. <laughs> and he would come home, and some of y'all are going to think this is so absurd. He would come home, and I had a deal. We all, all the kids had a deal with my dad. He would wake us up, and we would go down and sit at the kitchen table at 2 o'clock every morning. Not every morning, but the mornings he brought them. And we would eat donuts in the middle of the night, hot donuts from Rudy's Donut Shop. You know what? Now, I can close my eyes and think about that memory right now. I thought of it this morning when I was eating a donut, in fact. But that's a, that's a memory that I have, a good memory that I have, and I think it attributes to my love for donuts today. Here's what I want you to do, whether it, yours is about donuts or food or, or not. I want you just to take a moment, and I want you just to turn to someone near you and share a memory, a good memory, from your childhood. Would you do that? Just turn, turn to people right there. Which means if you're just staring at me, that's probably not what I'm asking you to do, all right? Just a good memory from your childhood. So a good memory from your childhood. All right. Very good. Now, how many of you heard something that was, if I can borrow Sister Celinda's term, pretty cool? That was pretty cool what you just heard someone say. Kind of neat. How many of you heard a tradition, perhaps, that that person 
had in their family, tradition. Anybody food-related? Since I started it with food, anybody food-related? Lexi, all right. Lauren, Stacy, all right. All right, uh, Nicole, Celinda, good. Anybody donut-related? We might as well just zero in here. No, okay, all right. Amen. Now, the reason why I had us do that is because there is a term that is used predominantly in the first three chapters of First John that deal with some of the very same time frames that we just talked about with regards to being a child. We have discussed over the last several weeks, you can take your Bible, by the way, and turn to First John chapter 3, but we've discussed over the last several weeks that First John is a wonderful study which balances three main things. First of all, it is a study in encouragement. All of us need encouragement. And John writes this letter, this first letter known as 1 John, to do encouragement uh, to the the body of Christ. Uh, Secondly, he writes this letter to educate so that there will be learning that will take place. And thirdly, he writes 1 John to warn and to guide. So it is encouragement, it's education, and it is warning. Now, it's interesting to me that these three components, as I begin to look through 1 John and kind of break it down as to what it contains, really fall in lockstep with what the Word of God should do in our lives. Not just 1 John, but the, all, the, the totality of Scripture. Uh, the Bible is given to us to encourage, to help us, make us feel like we can do this thing. It's also given to educate us. In fact, the Scripture says of itself that that's one of the things that it's profitable for, for doctrine or for teaching. And then it's also given to us to warn. I talked a little bit about this Wednesday night. We can be in settings where the Word of the Lord is being taught or preached, and it get in our business, it step on our toes. And that's not because God's wanting to make us miserable. He's wanting to, he's wanting to warn us. He's wanting to guide us and direct us. But I want you to notice a term or two words, rather, that are used over and over in the first three chapters. Let's look at it. 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 1. Now, I know we're started, where this study today is on 1 John chapter 3, but go with me to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Look at the 12th verse of 1 John chapter 2. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Would you skip down to the 18th verse of 1 John chapter 2? Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming Even now, many antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. Keep going down to verse 28 of 1 John chapter 2. And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Now, what are the two words that are used in all four of these references that is repeated? Anybody talking? Little children. And so John is saying to his audience, little children. Now, on the surface, that may seem like a derogatory thing. If, if, if we think of children, sometimes we can think of naivete. Sometimes we can think of immaturity. Sometimes we can think of ignorance, not meant as a a slam against children, but just a lack of knowledge. They don't have the knowledge base that an adult has. And yet it is John who is wanting to communicate something so much more than that. He's wanting these believers to whom he writes to understand, you are born of Christ. You are a child of God. And we're going to talk a little bit about this this morning, this whole idea of how important identity is 
to, in a Christian walk. Um, you know, if, if you feel confident in your family, it makes you act a certain way. If you feel a lack of confidence in relationship, it also makes you act a certain way. Uh, for instance, and I, and I won't just belabor you with personal stories here, but when my dad was working at the Ford Motor Company, my brother and I and my mother went to go visit him one day. My brother and I were very young at the time, just little pipsqueaks running around. And when we walked into the plant, they gave us these yellow uh, hard hats to wear. We thought that was awesome. It was for our safety, but, you know, it was, it was neat to have hard hats on. So here go these two little twin boys, and my mother, she had a hard hat too. Just envision that. That'd be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> and the three of us go traipsing through the big Ford Motor Company plant, and, and we were there to see my dad. And there was this large staircase that went up to where all the executive offices were, and my dad's office was up there. And so Todd and I thought this is really cool, this big staircase, hard hats. I mean, it's like a playground. So we now have this playground inside of this, uh, which is a staircase, and hard hats. And we go running up that staircase and running down the catwalk there, and, and we're just really causing a scene. And one of the executives there, I never will forget this, came out of his office, and he stopped us, and he said, whoa, 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 boys, where are you going? In other words, why are you even here right now? This is not a place for little kids. And uh, I, I don't remember what I said to him, but my mother said to this individual, we're here to see Jim Gaddy. And um, to which the man said, well, who is Jim Gaddy to you? And I piped up and said, that's my dad. And everything changed when I said that. He said, well, his office is right down here, boys. Let me take you right where his office is. Why? Because there was a confidence in me that whoever has that office up in that executive area, that's not just another worker. That's my dad. When there's a confidence it changes how you act, and it changes your behavior, and it dictates how we uh, go through life. And, and so John is expressing this term, little children, not to put them down, not to put the hearers of this word down, but to un help them to understand the, the place they have in relationship with the Lord. And uh, when we understand the context of John's first letter here, uh, we will find as we study it that it wasn't written to a specific group of people. Uh, whereas Ephesians was written to the church at Ephesus and Philippians was written to the church at Philippi. The, the epistle, the, by the way, those of you that are new to studying the Bible, the word epistle, when it says the epistle of 1 John, the word epistle means a letter. So the letter written by John was written to the general Christian public of that day. And so it's good for us today. We, we, we can't look at 1 John and say, well, that was pigeonholed for the church in whatever town that is, and that must not apply to us. No, John is trying to get a principle and a truth apart, uh, across to us, and that is this. You are children of God. And I want to say this to New Life on this Sunday morning. We don't have to duck our head or cower in shame. We are born as children of God. And when we understand our identity and our place in the kingdom of God and from whom we have been born, it will dictate our behavior and it will help us. Look at verse 1 of 1 John chapter 3. Behold, behold, I like that word because that speaks of, hey, get, get, it, get this, get attention here. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. I want you to notice one of the words in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, and that is the word bestowed. The Scripture says that the love of the Father has been bestowed upon us. The word bestowed, by definition, means to cause. To give forth from one's self. And so the love that the Lord has for us, the love that our Heavenly Father has for us, is not a transplanted love that He grabs from somewhere else and gives to us, but it rather is a love that literally comes from Him. It is manifest from Him. And then the Scripture says He bestows that love on us that we should be called everyone say called that we should be called the children 
of God. This word called literally means to be called aloud and to be called by name. It's amazing the study when you and I start dissecting scripture. What happens when we study this idea of something coming from God himself with a voice calling forth? With that in mind, go with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 3. Some of you have heard me say this before. Uh, Brother Odell is here, and, and he was my preaching teacher in college. And one of the things, I, many, many things I won't forget that he taught me, but one of the things he said is when you ask people to turn in, your, in their Bibles to a passage, wait until you don't hear pages turning anymore, and that lets you know they're there. Well, that was 30 years ago before iPads, before smartphones. So probably what I need to do now is say, turn in your Bible, and those of you that are tech savvy, wave at me when you're there. <laughs> Matthew chapter number 3, and I have an actual Bible, uh, pages Bible, so let me get there. Matthew chapter number 3 and verse number 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. By the way, I won't get into this, but this is a wonderful example of why we need to be baptized. Because Jesus was baptized. He said, I'm fulfilling the will of the Lord here by being baptized. Verse 16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Look at verse number 17. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Notice as we kind of connect the dots here with this whole, whole idea of something coming from God and there being a call that identifies who that is. Matthew chapter 3 tells us that Jesus did not come separate from God. He didn't come separate from the Father. But Jesus, according to Scripture, is the image of the invisible God, the Scripture says. He is God manifest in flesh. And when this happens, there is a declaration from that creative God that says, this is my image. This is my beloved Son. There's something that came from God, and there was a calling forth, a declaring forth over Jesus in that water that day. We are declared children of God when something is declared over us. Isn't it interesting that this principle carries through in the New Testament day that we live right now? We come to the waters of baptism, and what happens? Something is spoken over us that affects our past, it affects our present, and it affects our future. Amen. It is declared over us. Uh, we go to the waters of baptism. The name of Jesus is declared over us. And in that moment, we attain and obtain an identity as a child of God. I want to say it again. Brothers and sisters and people in this room today, uh, we are children of God when we are born of water. We are children of God when we are born of spirit. We're not just another group of people. We're not just another denomination. We, by virtue of water and spirit baptism, are children of God. Now let me go a little further in this. We're not just people who are trying to be good. And we're not just people who have certain beliefs and certain rituals and certain ceremonies dictated by an overlording church. But we have become new creatures in Christ Jesus. We have been transformed, not just informed, we've been transformed by the Lord. We've been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The scripture says we have been adopted by the Almighty. 
Uh, I won't have you turn there, but in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10, the scripture says we are God's craftsmanship. Or God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can perform or we can do the good things that he has planned for us from long time past. Everybody say I'm a new creature. Amen. You know what I need to do? If I'm a new creature, I need to act like I'm a new creature. Amen. I need to walk in that identity. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not teaching this morning some pompous, arrogant attitude because you know what? There's no place in the kingdom for that. But God, help us to be sure in our identity. Help us to be secure in our identity. You know what? When I walk out of this church and I walk into my house, I walk through the aisles of Walmart, when I go pump the gas, when I walk through life, I'm walking through as a child of God. I'm not a part-time child of God. I'm not an on-vacation child of God. I'm a full-time child of God. I've been birthed into this kingdom. Amen. Amen. So John's point, of course, in 1 John chapter 3, is that as children of our Heavenly Father, we are ambassadors for Christ. Our life takes a different look. Our lives should look dramatically different. And the focus of our lives should be on a very much higher plane than the things of this world. Everybody say, I'm a child of God. And that shows us the great love of Christ. Verse number 2, Beloved, Now, we are children of God. He says amen to that. We are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, this is a verse that kind of has an interesting cadence to it. You know, we're children of God. It hasn't been revealed what we shall be, but we know when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It's kind of got an interesting cadence to it. But if you look at the middle of that verse, it says it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Now, this passage, that particular phrase used to always kind of bother me and confuse me because uh, he just got done saying, John just got done saying, we're children of God. But it has not been revealed what we shall be. Well, John, I thought you just said we're children of God. But when we study this verse, we understand, because the whole verse gives context, that the world does not see us like we see us. Now think about this with me. John chapter 1, the gospel of John chapter 1 and verse 11, says that Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. So the world didn't even recognize who Jesus really was. So it stands to reason that those who come from him, his children, will suffer from the same thing. I want to say this because I think it's important because you're not going to get this message in the world. You're a child of God. You're not going to hear people on your work go, you know, I just want to tell you something. You're a child of God. I can really tell you're a child of God. Unredeemed folks are not going to tell you. Unredeemed folks look at children of God and say they're zealots. They're right-wing conservative wackos. They're weird. Why? Because it hasn't been revealed to them yet who we are. But there's coming a day. When he is going to be revealed to the world. And the Bible says that every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess. And guess who's going to be ruling and reigning with him when that happens? You and I as children of God. And it's going to be revealed in that day who we really are. I want to say it again. I want to sound like a broken record. I want you to go to lunch today and say, man, pastor just had that in his craw. We are children of God, so let's act like it. That's good preaching, pastor. We are children of God. Hasn't been revealed what we shall be, but we know when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. 
If we have a hope of seeing him as he really is that day when he is revealed, it will produce in every child of God a desire for purity. To purify oneself. Now, I want to... I want to say something that I really want you to listen to because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. But I have noticed, and it's just all it is is my observation, I've noticed that there is a tendency sometimes in Christianity today, and I say that in the, the whole sense, the general sense of Christianity, to embrace the idea of, and here's where I want you to really pay attention, when we come to the Lord, He takes us just like we are, and he accepts us just like we are. And you know what? There is truth to that. You don't have to get good to get God. He does take us like we are. But it is wrong to assume that once we begin that relationship with him, he's okay with us just staying where we're at. That's sloppy. The scripture says, and we just read it, everyone who has the hope of seeing him one day revealed as, as Lord of this earth, is going to purify himself. And so, the closer we get to him, the more discriminant we must be in our lives. Now, this this doesn't make for preaching that everybody goes, Woo, I want you to preach that really hard, Brother Gaddy. But the closer I get to him, the less rights I have. And the more purity I should seek in my personal life. Verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. It's true, if we study this out in Scripture, that sin, which the, a great way to remember what sin means, it's missing the mark. Sin is the rejection of divine law. If you really look at the word sin, it's, it's taking what the Lord has said as his word and rejecting that. And the scripture says anybody that does that is guilty of missing the mark or guilty of sin. Sin is the rejection of divine divine law. Thus, sin is lawlessness. Now, I will say this, and I've I've taught this in different contexts here before. Um, God doesn't give us boundaries and rules, if you want to use that term, or truths in the scripture to somehow just really make us, oh, He's an he's a intolerant God. He's just a God that wants to rule our lives and make us miserable. That's not why God gives us boundaries. He gives us boundaries to protect us and to provide guidance and context for what success really is. Uh, if I can use a sports analogy, if, if we go to a basketball game and on the floor, on the basketball floor, there are no lines, there's no hoops, there's just a bunch of guys running around with a basketball. So, and, and the referee comes down out of the stands and says, today in this game, there's no rules. You just do what you want to do. If you want to throw the ball up in the stands, if you want to run outside and take a couple laps around the arena, that's fine. There's no rules today. Now, there'd probably be one dingling up in the stands as a fan that would go, yeah. But do you know how, how boring that would get after a while? Because it is the, it's the boundaries that determine success. It's the boundaries. And so God doesn't give us boundaries and guidelines and barriers, if you will, and law, divine law, to make us miserable. He gives it to us to define success in our Christian walk. And so anything that rejects that is called sin in Scripture. Look at verse number 5. You know that he, Jesus, was manifest to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Now, take, take your thoughts right now at verse 5 and skip down two verses to verse number 8. And we're going to see something interesting. Verse 5 says, he was manifested to take away our sins. Verse 8 says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So within four verses split apart... In 1 John, we see that Jesus was manifested first to take away sins, and he was also manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil, you say, what is that? That's the business. That's the employment. That's the enterprise of the devil. And so it is the devil's job to get God's children to ignore God's word. 
It is the devil's business to tempt us to ignore divine law. Can I just say this? Whenever we read something in the scripture and it is a boundary, it's a law, it's a truth that the Lord has laid down for our good, if we ever, if I ever respond to that when I read that and go, nah, I don't think so. I'm in a dangerous place. Because the enemy's job is to tempt me to ignore what God's word says. That's his job. All right? Now, th this is... Everybody okay today? You getting something? All right. Let's go to the two verses in between the two that I just read. Verse 6. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Mm, we'll come back to that in a second. Whoever sins has, either, has neither seen him nor known him. Now, I have heard of a doctrine... Uh, I, I've never known anybody personally that believed this doctrine, but I've heard of the doctrine that once you become a child of God, you cannot sin. Like it's impossible to sin. I've heard that before. I actually don't think the Bible teaches that. Now, many times people will go to this verse and say, well, it says it right here. Whoever abides in him does not sin. We have to keep reading to find the context. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Inferred and indwelling in the sixth verse of 1 John chapter 3 is the idea that whoever abides, and Selinda mentioned this a minute ago, that Pastor Larry defined this last Sunday morning, whoever abides in Christ... It's not that he can't sin. It's that he will not continue to practice sin. And this has everything to do with understanding Calvary and what it means to us today. L let me show you like this. Uh, as children of God today, born of the Spirit of God, we practice daily what he is all the time. Let me show you this from the Bible. God exists, the scripture says, as righteous. The scripture says that. But we today practice righteousness and we live it out every single day. So through our practice of righteous truth and guidelines from the scripture, we become who he already is. Are you with me so far? The Bible says that God exists as Holy, that's part of his immutable nature. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. Here's what the scripture says. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. In other words, walk out and practice the attributes of who he exists as. He is holy, and so I practice holiness today. Are you with me? He is righteous and so in my lifestyle, I open up the Bible, I find out what a righteous life should entail, and I walk that out, I practice that. And so John is not teaching that a child of God is incapable of sinning. John is teaching here that a child of God does not practice sin, stay in sin. This is, this is amazing when you and I think about this. Calvary saved me from the penalty of sin. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. You being dead in your trespasses has forgiven your trespasses, wiped out that which was contrary to us, has taken it out of the way, and nailed it to the cross. Anybody glad your sins were nailed to that cross? So he did something with our sins, our past sins. He nailed them to the cross. But notice what Calvary did not do. Calvary did not remove the temptation to sin. Why? Because we win or lose that battle every day through what we practice. So at Calvary, we were saved from the penalty of sin, but today, through the indwelling Holy Spirit, it saves me from the power of sin. Romans 6 and verse 14. Sin shall have no more dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. 
I'm talking what we practice, what we walk out. Now, I'm thankful that as a spirit-filled believer today, I don't have to be bound anymore by the power of sin. But he's given me something inside of me to fight against that dominion, fight against that power. Amen. Is that making sense? Now, let me just throw this in too because this is good. My obedient response to God's grace will one day also save me from the presence of sin. Calvary saves me from the penalty of sin. The Holy Ghost saves me from the power of sin. And my obedient response to his great grace will one day save me from the presence of sin. According to Scripture, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27, speaking of heaven, the new Jerusalem, there shall by no means enter anything that defiles. Let me quickly go to verse number 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. And again, it's the inference here is practice sin, continuous sin. For his seed, God's seed, remains in him. That one phrase speaks of the indwelling Holy Spirit. We were born of incorruptible seed, the scripture says, when he gave us his spirit. And he cannot sin or continue in sin because he has been born of God. Verse 10, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. There are two signs, according to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10, that indicate who real children of God are. There's two telltale signs. Number one, they practice righteousness. And number two, they love their brother. So I want you to look at someone and say, those are the two signs right there. Say they practice righteousness. Number two, they love their brother. All right? Now, if that's true, according to Scripture, verse 10, there are also two signs of those who are of the devil. It's those who practice unrighteousness, and number two, those who don't lo love their brother. All right? Now, because John is, is writing and teaching to born-again people, when he says brother, he's not talking about who Todd is to me, biological brother. He's speaking about spiritual brother in the same family of God. Now, th this is heavy, and, I, and, I, and I'm not closing this lesson on a downer note, but I am obligated to teach exactly what the Word of God says. If I'm going to be a child of God, it's going to be through a practice of right living and a love for brothers and sisters. And if I'm going to be identified as of the devil, and I don't want that, it will be characterized by my lack of practicing righteousness or and my lack of love for brothers and sisters. And so we have to take an inventory of our lives. Is there anybody in the church that we're hateful toward? Is there anybody that we don't love? And by the way, we're called to love everybody. Doesn't mean we trust everybody. but we're called to love everybody. And that proves that we're children of God. That's a practice of a child of God. Listen, if we consistently have a problem with someone and it rises to the level of hate and uh, feeling towards someone that we just can't handle being around them and they're a child of God, listen, I'm not going to pull any punches. Here's what John says. That's of the devil. That's just not another opinion. That is of the devil. Because it's the devil's job to destroy and to divide and to cut people off of fellowship. I don't want anything to do with that. I want to practice righteousness, and I want to love the brotherhood. Amen. I want you to stand with me, please. Praise the Lord.